In a better working world, there is collaboration. With collaboration, ideas flourish, connections emerge, visions are realized. When business works better, the world works better. This is why all of us, every day, around the globe, focus on building a better working world. Uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and, and thank you, Joe, for the introduction. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm the CEO of EY for in, in Oceania. Um, and a little bit, you may know us more as Ernst & Young. We've had a rebranding from Ernst & Young to EY. But we're a global professional services firm with over 200,000 people uh, across the globe. And uh, a full range of uh, services we provide to business, industry and government. And I guess our global connectedness means we work on the ground with businesses in Australia and New Zealand, as well as in their export uh, destinations. And that gives us excellent insights into the business of ag agriculture, not only locally, uh, but around the world. I guess my personal business link to Agri um, goes back a, a number of years and it, it, with my first paycheck, and it was a check. Uh, after a week's rousing in the wool shed, my grandfather presented me with a check for $30, which wasn't bad, as I said, for a 13 year old. Um, but he did also stress to me that this check was very significant and it should be treasured and, pot and it should be framed rather than cashed. Uh, he certainly wasn't silly. And I also spent uh, some time at the top of a hay shed, 40 degree days during hay carting season, which probably drove me to uh, go down an accounting path. Some of my colleagues are with me today and I'd particularly like to acknowledge our partner, uh, Andrew Metcalf, who I can't quite see, but he is here somewhere. Um, Andrew leads our work in food, fibre, agribusiness and biosecurity in Australia and New Zealand. Um, and some of you may know that Andrew is a former secretary of the Australian Department of Agriculture. And we, like everyone in this room, are committed to the, the success of this sector. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to follow Andrew Forrest this morning. And uh, Andrew clearly highlighted his passion for the business success of Australian agriculture, including his work with the ASA 100. And uh, you know, congratulations to Andrew for the leadership he's showing in bringing China and Australia uh, together. And I'd also like to commend uh, Andrew Crane for his insights. Uh, that he shared in creating value for the Australian economy and society, and we're delighted to work with CBH, one of Australia's most prominent cooperative and certainly a leader in, a leader in the Australian grain industry. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this morning I wanted to do three things. Uh, one was to outline some ideas we've considered to address the long-term issue of debt levels facing some of our primary producers. Secondly, briefly highlight the key things that we believe governments can do to enable prosperity in agriculture, and then finally, just share some insights directly from business. The long-term issue of debt levels facing some of our primary, producer, primary producers is critical to the future success of the industry. And the government's green paper on agricultural competitiveness indicates that the level of debt in the sector is a concern for both the government and primary producers. Many segments of the agriculture sector and some of Australia's regions face unsustainable debt burdens with arrears in repayments now above those experienced by the wider business sector during the recovery from the global financial crisis. Whilst, of course, some participants will need to leave the sector, and I acknowledge the personal heart heartache that that can bring, we believe that there are many viable farming businesses that can again be successful if they're able to restructure their debt profile and gain access to capital to assist their growth. And now is a good time to do this. Right now, the lower Australian dollar means our farm exports are more competitive. Alongside this, good rain across much of our cropping and pastoral land has improved soil mo moisture profiles and eased the pressure on some farmers struggling with dry conditions. Now, this is good news and will mean that some farmers will be able to pay down debt. But debt is a long-term problem, and we believe that this is the right time to make real and sustainable change. Successive governments have responded to this issue in a variety of ways most recently through the provision of concessional loans through the Farm Finance Concessional Loan Scheme. We're seeing alternatives to bank debt uh, as a key source of finance emerging. And in recent months, my colleagues in our capital debt advisory and corporate restructuring businesses have given careful consideration to the issue of rural debt and reflected on the considerable investor appetite they are seeing for a wide range of debt capital raising transactions. Based on our experience and insights, we've identified two innovative approaches that we believe could be implemented to support the sector. 
The first is the provision of commercial advisory and capital raising support to assist the agribusiness sector in attracting new debt and equity capital so as to support the growth, innovation and development of the sector, particularly focused on the entrepreneurial uh, element of the market, but also the small element of the market. Secondly, restructuring of agricultural problem loans by undertaking a wholesale restructure of underperforming loans using third party investor capital, thereby creating a platform for those farmers to remain on the land. We believe that there could be immediate benefit to rural communities, uh, a reset of agricultural land prices and the re release of capital from the banking sector, which could then be relent to the sector. We also believe these measures would encourage innovation from farmers who had previously operated over levered farming operations. Importantly, these solutions are also effective outcomes in the current constrained government budgetary environment, as they only require government sponsorship and support with the capital being delivered by the, investor, by the investor markets. I'd just like now to turn to outline a number of key things that we believe governments can do to ensure prosperity in the agricultur agricultural sector. Governments have a critical role to play in creating the right environment for business and individuals to succeed. This includes the appropriate development of regulatory frameworks to ensure public safety, fairness and certainty. However, over-regulation, overly complex regulation or inefficient regulatory practices can bring with them high compliance costs that impede individual and commercial success. The agricultural sector is exposed to regulatory requirements and processes right across the value chain. Therefore, the incremental impact of these regulations can have a significant impact on the way we do business and the cost of our agricultural goods. In a global environment, which we operate, the regulatory framework in any particular country can be a key factor in gaining and maintaining competitive advantage. We applaud initiatives being undertaken by the government to examine its regulatory frameworks and to seek to repeal and streamline areas that are unnecessary or inefficient. However, we believe there is more that can be done to look at the total value chain impact of regula regulation across all governments and regulatory agencies. Government can help to build a more efficient environment for Australian agribusiness and farming by redoubling efforts to improve, reduce and streamline regulatory activity, commit to real, effective and consultative processes and to look at the whole burden of regulation. We also applaud the government developments in relation to trade agreements with key destination countries for our agricultural products. The work of many officials and political leaders to be commended, and we particularly note the role played by Andrew Robb, our Trade Minister, in this regard. The challenge now is to ensure that our exporting businesses can take advantage of the opportunities that have opened up. To be effective, trade deals need to be converted into market access. This can be a smooth process in some cases, but highly problematic in others. Particularly in relation to the export of products, that are destined for human consumption, where biosecurity and health considerations are, of course, extremely important. I do note the valuable work played by our Department of Agriculture, Minister Barnaby Joyce, in working to ensure our products are able to access foreign markets, which is crucial to the success of our business and farmers. Science is another area of vital importance to, the modern, to modern farming in Australia. According to Australia's chief scientist, Professor Chubb AC, Australia will only be able to meet its obligations as an exporter of premium products if it is prepared to accept the cost of adapting to changes in the environment. There are questions for scientific investment that cannot be overlooked. How are we going to adapt our agricult agricultural product produce to shifting rainfall patterns? How are we going to adjust to increased salinity of arable soils? And how are we going to ensure that as our populations and city grows, cities grow, the human footprint will not intrude on our productive agricultural land? We're not going to be able to do any of that unless we invest in the science that's required to give the answers to the problems of today and the problems of the future. Governments, of course, play a key role in supporting research and development in the agricultural sector. Australian organisations like CSIRO have an enviable record of success through both pure and applied research. For example, the current success and ongoing viability of the Australian cotton industry has been underpinned by CSIRO's development of over 100 strains of GM cotton, far better able to adapt to dry conditions and requiring vastly reduced use of herbicides and pesticides. 
Similarly, our agricultural research and development corporations have been instrumental in boosting productivity across all of our agricultural sectors. Additional funding provided to the RDCs in recent times is welcome evidence of the government's commitment to this sector. I also note the recent significant investment in industry growth centres where agriculture has been identified as a priority. I'm sure that elsewhere in this conference from the issue of flatlining productivity improvement uh, in the sector will be discussed. No one here needs reminding, it's been highlighted by, by previous speakers, the role of government in providing critical infrastructure for our supply chains, roads, rails and ports. And governments also have a crucial role to play in the regulation of basic natural resources such as land and water. Other key inputs to farming enterprises such as access to reliable power, technology and communications are also heavily influenced by government policy through training and migration programs. Many people in the room would also recognise the important role played by governments in Australia's biosecurity. The activity is essential to safeguard Australia from the introdu introduction of exotic pests and diseases, as well as ensuring that the product is able to be both exported and imported safely and successfully. ABES has estimated that a serious incursion of foot and mouth disease in Australia would not only bring econo economic losses of up to $52 billion, but would also destroy the livelihoods of many Australian primary producers and decimate the economies in parts of rural and regional Australia. We also need to consider the role of industry in providing leadership to government around each of these issues. The dispersed nature of the agribusiness industry, not only in terms of commodities and geographies, but the reliance across the value chain means there is a strong role for leadership in this industry. The innovation of organisations such as the Voice of Horticulture bring together businesses across the fruit, nut, turf, nursery, nursery plants and cut flower industries. This organisation plays a key role in providing a coordinated voice for these industries. Finally, I would like to share with you the results of two surveys EY has recently undertaken, which provide insights from our clients in the agribusiness sector. One is a global survey and the other is more specific to Australia. The global survey, which is known as EY's Global Capital Confidence Barometer, it's an annual survey of senior executives from large companies around the world and it's conducted by the uh, Economist Intelligence Unit. The barometer gauges corporate confidence in the economic outlook and identifies trends to help companies manage their capital agenda. And the key findings in that indicate that with greater clarity of economic outlook internationally, as well as an improved credit environment and corporate earnings, companies are more confident in their plans to increase workforce numbers. Secondly, almost 70% of the agriculture respondents expected to increase their deal pipeline in the next 12 months. In other words, there is a high level of momentum for mergers and acquisitions in the sector. In Australia, this is particularly impacted by interest from foreign investors. It's probably too early to tell whether the recent changes to foreign investment rules will impact on this, but we can be confident that the recent free trade agreements that Australia has entered will promote commercial activity and opportunities in the sector, including improved market access into China, Korea and Japan. Locally, we surveyed a range of businesses across the agribusiness supply chain. We asked a series of questions in relation to the opportunities, challenges, competitive advantage and policy frameworks for the agribusiness industry. We found that Australian agribusinesses are more focused on growth over the next 12 months compared to their local peers. Australian agribusinesses are more cautious than their global counterparts about the slowing growth of emerging markets. And Australian agribusinesses see organic growth coming from new geographies and markets and a more rigorous focus on core products and existing markets. This compares with global counterparts who saw organic growth coming from a changing mix of existing products and services or increasing uh, R&D or product introductions. In relation to opportunities, demand from new and emerging foreign markets was a key opportunity, with 100% of respondents suggesting that this is a major or moderate opportunity for them. Other opportunities, including taking advantage of free trade agreements, increased product differentiation and specialisation in supply chain optimisation. In relation to challenges, 88% of respondents stated that increasing international competition was a major or moderate challenge to their business. 
84% flag rising import costs, including the cost of land, as a moderate or major challenge to their operation. And 72% suggested national infrastructure, including the freight network, ports and broadband, as a moderate or major challenge to their operations. Very similar findings to those that, that Andrew highlighted. When it came sh uh, to shedding light on what gives Australia its competitive advantage, respondents were very clear. It is our reputation as a producer of clean, safe and high quality food and fibre products, and more specifically, quality, brand Australia and quarantine measures. And when it came to business insights on policy, the most highly valued policy intervention addresses free trade, 64% saw this as a major opportunity to promote growth, increasing government funding to agricultural institutions, more than half, 52% saw this as a major opportunity to promote growth, along with building relationships and upgrading national infrastructure, where 48% saw major, major policy opportunities to support growth. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by reiterating that EY is passionate about helping building a better uh, agricultural and farming sector in Australia. And we know that everyone in this room and, and thousands of people in Australia share that ideal. Uh, we look forward to working with you in the years and, and decades ahead as we uh, continue to build and grow this vibrant sector of the Australian economy. Thank you.